All right. Uh, so just to get started. So remember, accommodations for midterms should be in by the 22nd. Uh, Graham, is that the new date for Prop 1 checkpoint? Yeah. OK, so uh, we realized after the fact that because we got a little bit behind in lectures, there were some things that we hadn't lectured about yet that were in the project. Uh, so we extended the checkpoint deadline. So in particular, functions. So if you ran into anything that said def uh, and got stuck, uh, don't worry about it. That's, it was just a timing problem. We can put two and two together. Um, the original uh, deadline for the actual project is the same. Uh, so keep that in mind. Uh, any questions? All right, cool. So today uh, we're going to talk some more about density. <laughs> and I think that it's a little easier with pictures uh, to talk about this. So um, that's why I have these slides. Um, but basically, when we're talking about a histogram, okay, the uh, what do we call it? The density of the stuff is indicated by kind of the height and width, right? So, as you can tell, right? So this one has got you know a much higher kind of density than than this one. Okay, so I don't think this is a build, but you know, for example, but the width kind of takes into account too because what we're looking at is like the area of it rather than in a traditional like bar chart where they're always the same so here the whole the count is actually the whole area or like the amount of things in the box um, and so we kind of imagine each of the things in the box being the same size uh, and then you kind of can add them up or you can you can do the math or whatever to figure out the area and that tells us the density of the items in that box or in that container or in that bin. Um, does that make sense? So that's what we, so with, we use histograms a lot more often, I think, in uh, data science than we do uh, like a bar chart because what we often want to know is the distribution of something across, you know, a, a space, right? So we don't necessarily want to know you know, that there were 30 movies that grossed, you know, this much money or whatever. What we want to know is like, it has, uh, you know, have there been more grossing movies recently rather than in the old days, for example. Okay, so that's kind of what we tend to be looking at is we tend to be looking at the distribution of things rather than kind of the pure count of things. Hence, histograms are often more useful than uh, like a bar chart. Does that make sense? So all these different charts that we've been talking about, as I said a lecture or two ago, um, it's really important to know what the difference is, okay, and when to use which. Um, and they're all very useful, but they only are good at certain things, right? So you wanna make sure that you're using it for the right thing. So to talk about density, the percent in the bin divided by the white, white width of the bin uh, equals the height, okay? So this is a very simple formula, but that's how you can figure out what, you know, how many units there are in that individual thing. A lot of the time, because like I said, we're looking more at the distribution, we often don't care that much about the literal number of things. What we care about is like the curve or whatever that you can see about the distribution across that space of data, okay? But this is how you figure it out. Um, and it also kind of is an indicator from a kind of a cross-checking perspective of like, did you do it right? Okay. So if the if that's if that doesn't work, if the math doesn't work, that's an indicator that your histogram is wrong somehow. Okay. All right. We have a question. So what does height not measure?
All right, a few more answers, get them in there. All right, I'm gonna call it there, I think. Maybe. How many times can I click the button? So it looks like B was a very popular answer and B is also the correct answer, okay? So crowdedness, right, is kind of a colloquialism for density. Okay. Does anybody hear what a colloquialism is? What I what I love to do is define a word with using an even bigger, less commonly used word. Uh, colloquial is when you um, it's like slang. It's colloquialism. Uh, so crowdedness is quasi a real word, um, but it gets the idea, right? So how big is the crowd? Uh, and then density. Is, is kind of the right answer in a sense. And then kind of A is a little bit more, you know, kind of the, the verb, the wordy version of the same thing. Okay, so uh, fill in the formula by matching the letter to what it should represent. The reading test on these is also pretty amazing. <laughs> All right, so hopefully y'all can see that picture. All right, click those buttons. I think it's kind of interesting that you all can also see how many people have answered. All right, I'm calling it. And looks looks pretty good. So on the left, you know, kind of on the left equal sign, we have the height, right? And then uh, on the top of the ratio or fraction, we have the percent in the bin. And then on the bottom, we have the width of the bin. Uh, and it looks like most of you got it. So it's pretty good. All right. So now we kind of look at it like talking about the same thing, except we want to talk about it in terms of our percentage. Okay. So again, because you know, like I, I keep feel like I keep reiterating this, but because we're looking at the distribution of something in a space, often the percentage, right, is is more interesting than the hard number. Okay, so I don't care so much that there were thirty movies, right? What I care is that ten percent, or you know, ten percent of the top grossing movies were in the seventies, and you know, whatever, eighty percent were in the nineties. I don't know, something like that. The percentage is often more interesting than the actual number. So this is just kind of another, this is how you can calculate the percentage. All right. And then just to kind of review all of the charts, okay, that we've talked about so far, there's obviously a ton of others, but these are the ones that we'll be using in this class. Um, but we have a scatter plot, which is a relationship between two numerical values. Then we have a line graph, which is a sequential, you know, sequential data over time, usually over time. Um, it could be over other things, but typically we have time on the X axis. Um, and then a bar chart is the distribution of categorical data. And then lastly, we have the histogram, which is the distribution of numerical data uh, over a space. All right, and surprise, surprise, there's another question related to the same. Um, what is the best plot for showing a distribution of categorical data?
All right. Oh, almost everybody, sorry. One person was still typing. Uh, okay, so correctly, it is a bar chart. And we have horizontal bar charts, and we have vertical bar charts, but it's bar chart. Then we have another question. What's the best plot for showing sequential data? All right, let's call it there. All right, and that is a line graph, All right? Or sometimes a line plot, or, you know, kind of use the term plot and graph semi-interchangeably. Um, and then I think we have one last question, and then we're gonna do a little bit more with charts. Oops, sorry, I thought I hit the start already. All right, so this is a matching. Like I said, it's kind of important that we keep track of all this. That's why we kind of keep asking about it. I know these are a lot harder to execute. So. All right, let's call it there so that uh, we can get through this whole lecture today. Those are the popularity contests. Still don't understand why we show that, but scatter plot is numerical data, line graph. Wait, no, sorry. <laughs> so scatter plot, I have a very hard time reading these things. Uh, scatter plot is the relationship between numerical variables, line graph, sequential data, bar chart, categorical, and histogram, numerical data or distribution of data uh, across uh, space. All right, so. This is a question as in, let's talk about it out loud. Okay, so what type of chart would I use to uh, indicate cloudy versus sunny days? A bar chart, that would make sense. Um, this may or may not be a bill, yeah, okay. Uh, so here's another one. What percentage of days have a high above 70 degrees? What would I use for that? Uh, when we go here. Yeah. Histogram? Yeah, that would make sense to me. Um, sorry. All right, do hotter days tend to also have hotter nights? Yeah. Probably, that would probably be the best bet, yeah. So some of these have, uh, and why I kind of hesitate, um, is because sometimes uh, you you may, depending on like the phrasing or whatever, may not be 100% clear on what you want to see. So think about the phrasing because this is, and I know I've mentioned this before, spoken language is kind of not always very clear. So, that's why I have to kind of think about it for a second to make sure I'm understanding the sentence correctly to make sure I'm, I'm kind of answering it correctly. I do also have a cheat sheet, which helps, uh, but 
the idea being is just that's why it may take you a minute to think about what the right answer is uh, for any of these given things. But if you have a good idea of what you want to display or understand, uh, the, you know, the answer should become obvious. Also experience helps. Uh, let's see. So let's jump over to this. If you copied the lecture over, uh, just now I realized I had a mistake. Um, the, the file is actually called this, not what I had typed in there, because um, it was the, another version of the class. Um, so I corrected it in one place, but not every place. So I'll just give you a second to do that while I run these. All right. And so hopefully some of you remember doing the survey. Um, I thought it was particularly interesting that uh, some people left like, uh, you know, sleep side out, but then answered all the other questions. And I was like, huh, all right. Um, so this is just kind of entertaining uh, to try to think about, you know, some of these questions. Uh, I obviously shortened them. So this is left or right handed. This is which pant leg you put on first. This is uh, the sleep side, and then this is uh, the, the best color of M&M, &M. um, and then programming uh, skill, and then Python skill, and then number of tech fees in the last 24 hours, how many people you tech in the last 24 hours, and then how much sleep you get. <clears throat> All right, let me, so, oops. Let me just clear the output so that it works a little better. All right, so this is the first thing we want to do, right, is try to understand the data we're looking at almost every time. Okay, so, uh, you know, the first thing you want to know is kind of like how many rows are there? So we had about 55 people fill this in such that I could use the data, right? So. Um, you know, there may have been more people who filled it in, but I deleted it. I deleted a row because it was messed up or broken or whatever. So that's the first thing. Then we look at, okay, let's say, all right, how many, uh, you know, people were left-handed versus right-handed. Um, unsurprisingly, the vast majority of people are right-handed. And so we can build a bar chart for that, right? Because we want to know which one uh, you know, how they compare to each other. Um, you know, this is wildly different. So, you know, it, it might actually be easier to see it from the numbers here, but most of the time a bar chart is really useful to be able to compare things visually. So you don't have to kind of figure out the numbers. Um, this one, I probably could have used a vertical bar chart because the words are small, but yeah. So you just use read table like you've done before. Um, it's just that if you look, at the files in that directory, it's the name of the file is this. Okay, which should be very close to the one that's there. It's it would have said 220 20, 03 DS100 survey partial. But this is the new one. All right, I'm gonna keep going. All right. So then we can start to look at histograms. And yeah, clearly I have a bunch of bugs in this file. I wonder if I'd be better off just killing this. Yeah, yeah. Um, so in my cheat sheet, it's right, but I it screwed up in the in the uh, updating this one because the basically the two tables were different. So I fixed one, but not the other, basically. Uh, so. Pissed and then <laughs> Python. So this is a very, 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 very common mistake. You just got to make sure that your uh, labels are right. Um, you know, including often including uh, the uh, casing. Sorry, I can't see because the picture of me is too big. Um, and then so, yeah. Let me just grab this and fix this real quick. Sorry about that. I thought they were better off. Oh, 
Can I use the right problem? Yeah. All right, so it probably means you guys are going to be able to really well answer the questions because uh, a lot of them will just be there. It's weird. Sometimes when I make them, they, uh, they don't save properly. So, all right, let's go back for this for a second. All right, and so if we want to do a histogram of the sleep column, what would I type? Yeah. Yep. And then as came up in my office hours, Be very careful whether you intend to have a string here or just a number here. Okay. So, you know, this is a string. If what would happen if I just put the word sleep? What is that? What is that implying? Right. So I could fix it, even though in a sense it's a terrible idea, but I could actually do this. And it will work, right? So just keep in mind, and, and one of the things that the notebook does, and most uh, kind of development editors or whatever, is you can actually tell by the color, right? If you're colorblind, there's usually options for switching the colors so that you can see them better if you can't see them. Um, but if you look at the color, this indicates that it's a string. Uh, I think, I want to say green indicates a number. Um, you know, I'm so used to it now. I don't even know what the colors are. I just like see them and they're right. Uh, so this should just work and it does. And so we do a histogram of the sleep. Um, and what I think is so interesting, right, is we end up with these weird like holes, right? So nobody said that they got, you know, six, between six and a half and seven hours of sleep, maybe. Um, you know, but the vast majority of people seem to have gotten seven hours of sleep. Uh, and we can obviously calculate the exact number of people. Yeah. Is there a way to make the bucket labels more clear? Can you define more clear? Oh, like to know like which column is exactly like what like. Like to put lines in or something like that? Like five to five and a half. Is that five to five and a half? Right. Yeah. So this this would be five and a half. Um, so yes, I don't usually go over that stuff in this class. Uh, but basically there's like a hundred options, maybe more for things that you can do to a graph to make it more visually appealing. We'll do a few of them, but not too many because like <clears throat> they're really nice when you wanna go like write a paper. Um, but when we're doing stuff like this, usually if you're glancing at it, you, you know enough about the data to know what it is. Um, what I'll often do, one of the things I don't like doing, even though I'm gonna do it a ton in this class, is I actually prefer to have my own bins so that I can like kind of put, like I know what's in the bin so that I know that it's five and a half or whatever and not rely on labeling in the graph. But, you know, it's kind of like a stylistic thing. All right. So now going by the graph, uh, what's the most sleep that people reported uh, having on average? No, uh, what's what's the most amount of hours, not the most people? Oh. Yeah, nine and a half, right? So obviously this is all self-reported. So for all we know, there are some people in here who average 12 hours of sleep or two, um, but this is what the reporting is, right? So, but if we wanna know for sure, we can, What can we use to figure that out? What function? Max. Max is your friend. And then we just say survey column. Did I type it wrong? Oh yeah. It's a special kind of restaurant. Um, okay, so, but what's cool, right, is I can still use my garbage variable. Um, and it'll still work or should still work. And so we can get, oops, I meant to print it. All 
And so nine and a half hours, obviously relatively easy to tell with the histogram, but if you can't, um, that can be handy. So then we can do the same, except let's do this all for min. And as you would guess, it's min. So then we have five hours of sleep there. So now we might want to do our own bins, right? So in order to do our own bins, let's do sleep bins equals. Um, so let's just do a set of bins. Just looking at my cheat sheet here. Um, we want to go from the you know the the smallest number that's in there okay to the highest number that's in there because we want to include everything in the histogram um but we want to do it by let's say blocks of two hours so what would i put in for to do that so i don't have to type them manually like what function can i use range. a range yeah um there is a range as well which is a different story but so we're going to use numpy's a range okay so we use MP to use a NumPy. And what would I put in for the bottom? Yeah. Let's use the variable. Cool. So then if it changes, if we add anything to the survey, right, our, our code is more tolerant for change later. All right, so what would I put next? Just that? Yes, but we need something else in there. Up. Yep. Uh, because it's not inclusive, right? So we want to do plus one and then two, as you said before, to get the, um, uh, to do uh, two hour chunks, right? And then, Sleep bins. All right. Uh, and if you notice, um, these are all floats, right? Because we have things like half hour clocks. Um, and then, you know, so now we have some sleep bins. Um, but then down here, and the reason you, you probably have this included already because there's a lot of typing, um, but I think it's wrong. Yeah. So, we just want to take out the hours here. This will teach me to change the column names. All right. And so does anybody have a guess as to what this is going to show us? Exactly. So, what uh, to somebody else? So, what question would we be trying, or you know, what's a question that you can kind of think of that we'd be trying to answer with this? Right. So, you know, so let's say we're trying to figure out if sleeping on your right side or on your left side is more likely to uh, require more or less sleep, right? Um, and what I think is cool about doing this with actual class data, right, is in this particular class, clearly you need more sleep if you're a right side sleeper, but if you're a left side sleeper, you need less sleep to some extent. I don't know. Um, I'm kind of like eyeballing the numbers quickly while we're doing this live, um, but you get the idea. So you can kind of answer, you know, fun questions about the data you're looking at, um, you know, and then if you were doing a research study, this would be a real thing, right? And then I think, oh, we have one more um, because as I was kind of saying before, um, we can use our own bins. And so we use a labeled attribute or parameter. Um, 
And so now we have different size bins. So to your <laughs> earlier point, right? You can see the little line here where the two bins are, um, but it can be a little confusing uh, because there's also the grid, right? But you need the grid to be able to figure out the percentages. So there it is. Um, but if you want to get into fancy colors and that kind of stuff, you certainly can. All right, let's go back to the slides. Which are here. And we'll move on to talk about, oops, um, methods. Okay. So we've been using methods and or functions kind of a bunch as we go through, um, you know, so far like max and min, right? Uh, one first and foremost thing I want to tell you is that the terms method and function are pretty interchangeable. Um, I will use both a lot. It's kind of like whichever one you learned first. In um, Python, I believe they are officially called methods. Um, but like I said, both terms are pretty interchangeable. It doesn't really matter which one you use, uh, but there it is. But what's the point, right? So the point of a method is for programmers, we're very, very lazy. And so we don't like writing the same piece of code more than once. There's also this concept uh, that comes out of actually a different programming language community called the, what's called dry. Okay, and that's an acronym that says, um, don't repeat yourself. In other words, another reason to use methods is because then you can encapsulate some piece of work in one place. Basically, so yes, for the lazy, but also so that you only, like you only type it once. Therefore, if you have a mistake, you only make the mistake once, okay? Or it reduces the likelihood that you make the mistake. If you keep writing the same block of code over and over again, the likelihood you have a mistake in one of those is pretty high, right? Just because your fingers are typing incorrectly. So we use methods basically for those two things primarily. Yeah. Is every time it's a 50 50 chance you either have an error or you don't if you keep repeating it uh, i think humans are too stupid for that so sure you know um but at least i would argue that no you're way more likely to have a typo because if i have the error then i see it in one place and i can fix it in one place i don't have to find all the places where that took place right so i guess it's more on the fixing side than creating the error uh any other questions okay so i think this is also going to build yes so the various parts of a method or a function this is the keyword that indicates that this is a method or function so def is again programmers are lazy def is short for define okay and we're going to give it a name much like a variable name okay so if you kind of think about it we're kind of shoving this block of code into this variable name called spread. Okay. Then this is one of those build slides where it's like too much building. Then we have the things that are in the parentheses. Okay. So these are called arguments or argument names, or sometimes they're also referred to as parameters. Okay. Again, I'll probably use them interchangeably. Um, but I think, like I said, I think Python calls them arguments official. Um, this is just another name, okay? So it should be representative of what you think that should be, okay? So does anybody know what a spread is when we talk about like sports or like betting? Yeah. I know it in the context of like financial markets. Yeah. The bid and the ask, which is like the buying, what people are willing to sell for and what people are willing to buy. Right. So usually it's the difference between kind of like one end of a spectrum and the other end of a spectrum. Okay. When you talk about it in the stock market, you're talking about the price that people will buy the stock for versus the price that people will sell it for. Okay. That's the spread between them. 
um, when you talk about sports, it'll be the spread between the you know team A score and team B score. And there's often betting on the difference between those two numbers. Okay. Um, I assumed most people in the classroom would at least be more familiar with sports than they were with stock market, but you know, everyone's different. Um, I actually probably know way more about uh, sports, like the spread stuff, like the math stuff, than I do about actual sports. So, but you know, I'm a nerd. So there you go. Um, so that's what this function does, theoretically, right? It's not really brilliant, but so as a result, the parameter to it is this thing called value. So in other words, the inputs are the, you know, the bottom end and the top end, the bid and ask price of you know, whatever that stock is, let's say. And the way it's going to work is we're going to return the max values subtracted from the min of values. Okay. And that's the spread in that array of numbers. So, uh, you know, I don't have a great example of a spread with more than two, but theoretically, you could have 16 different numbers in there and it'll still work. So, this part is referred to as the body. Okay. And these are all kind of like keywords that will make your life easier to know what it is. Um, my, uh, looks like I got some, some warping there. Um, so the body is actually this, this whole area here. And then the return, okay, is indicated by the keyword return. Let me actually go back so that the colors are a little better. So this is another keyword like that. It's called return. And this is what will be the output of this method. So if you think about it as a variable, right? And where I had my sleep variable that was equal to sleep, when I call that variable, when I get back as a string for sleep, when I call this method, it acts just like any, you know, almost like a regular old variable, right? Except that it does something before return. That makes sense? Okay, so that's how you get. Um, this is how you create methods. And in the project, I want to say about question five ish, um, you need to use a method. That's why we extended the deadline in the textbook. Let's see. All right. Now, oops. Let's go back to that code and this code. All right, so let's say we wanted to make a method called triple. And that's tripe, which is a not very common American food. I mean, not very common in America, but it's a food. Um, how would I do triple? May have any ideas? All right. Yeah, except uh, I think what I was, yeah, three times actually, I was thinking it was uh, uh, raised to three, but no, triple means multiply. Uh, sorry. So return is our keyword, right? Because that's what we're going to give back when somebody calls this method. Uh, and three times whatever our input was here at, okay? Now, just like everything else, if I execute this, now this thing is available, okay? But I have to execute it first. So now I can do triple, let's say three, and it multiplies by nine and bang, we're done, okay? So now whenever I wanna do, you know, multiply by three, let's say I need to do it a whole bunch of times, but I actually want, I'm not, maybe I'm not 100% sure I always want to multiply by three. So I have this function that does something and we call it triple. So the example is a little contrived, but you get the idea. But it also works with variables as you've seen before. So now we can just pass in that variable. And if I execute this first, then execute this, it will work. Um, but the other thing that I want to point out, wow, is kind of going to buy that, you know, 
what is it, PEMDAS? I gotta like memorize that. Um, because it, like I think of it as almost like math, it's like because the parentheses are here, this operation will take place before it kind of calls that operation or the actual functionality of the triple method. And so, you know, so we multiply the number together and then we can triple it and we get 60. So, let me just, let me just look at the slides real quick to make sure. Okay, so why is this X not have a value considering we assign something to X like multiple times, right? So why is this X not working? Uh, let's see, anybody else? Well, it was a variable here, right? I mean, it's still a variable. I haven't defined it. it you're on the right track. It's outside of the body of the function, okay? And in programmer language, refer to that as scope, okay? So, do you have a question or? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Can you follow function on itself? So, could you triple, triple? You can. We'll get to that. I'll show you that in two seconds. We'll do this and then we'll talk about that. Um, so X, because it was inside the method, isn't available outside the method. Does that make sense? So it's it's scoped, and I don't is that an, is that a real English word? I can't remember anymore. It's what? Yeah. So local or global, uh, it, uh, like more programming terms for that is like local or global scope. Um, but the idea is that. It's only available in the scope that it's available in. Okay, so just don't make that mistake. It's very easy um, that just because you defined X somewhere, if it was inside a method, it won't be there outside the method. Uh, so that's why with a function like this, we'll often use something like a really simple variable name like X. Okay, because you only need to know what it is in the scope of this method. So instead of doing something intelligent like number two triple, okay, we just use something like X or whatever because it's short, it's easy, and because the context is so small, we can kind of follow what it's supposed to be doing. So generally speaking, we want to use nice variable names, but if you have a really small scope or really small context, you might want to do something simpler. All right, so let me go back here. Sorry. So then if I define it, okay, let's say I define it as five, but if I call triple, and let's say I pass, I don't know, three, what am I gonna get back? Okay, so I'm gonna get back nine, but why am I gonna get a nine? Like, shouldn't I get, 15 times, th or shouldn't I get five times three? No? Oh, okay. No, because if you go back to your function, you define what you're inputting in the function as uh, x, but that's a lower x. Right. And so this x, right, is not the same as that x because they're two different scopes. One is the overall scope, and one is inside this little scope. So things on the outside also don't exist on the inside. All right, and vice versa. Make sense? So that's the way you can get away with doing a lot of these tricks so that you don't end up like, you know, having to, you know, have unique variable names across all of your code. Uh, you can, you know, you can keep their scope small and it makes your life a lot easier. Um, the other thing to point out, okay, so if I do triple, three. Now I pass in the three to the X. So what happens if I print X? Uh, how about somebody over there? 
What happens, what, what number am I gonna get if I print out X? Anybody over there in that corner? Yeah. Five, right. Why isn't it three? Because I assigned the three inside the function, right, to X. Why is this X still five? Am I now? Right. So because it's two different scopes, it's like it's two different things. So just don't fall into the trap of thinking that just because it's got the same like letters, it's the same thing. Okay. Which is you know tempting. And like when you're when you're if you have some sort of example, whatever that's more complicated, um, it can be a, a mistake, a you know, relatively easy mistake to make is just recognizing what scope the thing that you're messing with was in and making sure you're in the right one. Um, so going back to your earlier question, okay, which is, oops, let me put it here. Can I do So this is partially your earlier question. Can I, will this work? Right. So what it's gonna do is it's gonna triple the 10 and get 30. And then that 30, because we think about the friends, right? That 30 is gonna get passed into triple again, we're gonna get 90. Now, here is something you never wanna do. Well, let's say we wanted to do this. Well, you do want to do it sometimes, but what's going to happen here? Uh, not quite. It's going to loop forever. It's going to just keep calling itself. Okay. And this concept is what's called, we call it recursion. Okay. You do use it sometimes, rarely, um, and it's usually a bad idea. But just be in, keep in mind, this will, like, it will never stop. Okay. It will just keep going until what's called a stack overflow error. Um, but so, so don't do that. Okay. Unless you really know what you're doing. Yeah. Uh, for the y in the variable scope, and we have a function a triple, and uh, we do return x into y. X, if we return. So triple has a parameter x. Yep. And we have a variable y in the variable scope. Yep. Would we, and we do x into y. Or like that? Yeah. So this is y in the variable scope. Oh, let's find out. All right, y equals 20. Let me run that and then we'll run this. And then, so what, what we should get if you're correct, right? Or if you, I mean, if, you're, if your supposition is correct, right? Um, is 20 times three, right? Or we'll get something else. Sorry. Do I fall through scope and I forgot about that in Python? Yes, it is fall through scope. Sorry, so I misspoke. Uh, too many different programming languages. If you have something on the outside, it will be valid on the inside of the method. And different programming languages treat that differently. So sometimes I forget which one I'm looking at. So let me just see. This also might be a notebook thing. Let me just check. Yeah, yeah. So outside here, this is what's referred to as global scope. So because it's global, it's available everywhere. Um, however, we also still, you know, it'll it'll change and all that kind of stuff too. So we got to keep in mind that we don't want to do this. This is usually a very bad idea. Okay because it relies on the person using this function to know 
that this variable needs to be set outside. Okay, this is partially why I don't know the answer to this very well, because I would never write that code. That's really bad idea. If you need this 30, right? If you need Z in here, you should pass it, even if it's closed. Okay. So in other words, I should make this two parameters like that and then do the multiplication like that. Yeah. That makes sense. So don't make your method need to be aware of the context it's in. Cool. Then we can get into some really weird scope stuff too, but we'll leave it alone. All right. Um, let's see. Yeah, so let's go back to methods for a minute. And just to give some examples, okay? So these are some of the, these are two of the methods that we're using, okay? So make array is basically, you know, the set of elements that you want to put into the array, okay? Uh, it's scatter, for example, this is makes the scatter plot. And these are all the different parameters or uh, uh, what do we call it? Uh, fields, the, there's another word on the point here, um, but the parameters that are optional or usable for this function. If you notice, some of them have an equal sign and a value, okay? That is referred to as an optional parameter, okay? Because it has a predefined value, but you can give it a new one, right? So I don't know if we... Yeah, so if you think about the histogram one, right, there would be one in here that says bins equals, right? And it'll say bins equals something. And that's how it will figure it out on its own. But if you pass it, it'll, you can give it a, a hard value. But we haven't done any of the scatter ones uh, yet. So that's not a great example. I should change the slide. Um, all right. So what do you think this would do? So I always go back to that, like I said, that thing, right? So basically go into the smallest set of friends. So the first thing we do is we sum whatever we get in X, okay? So if that's just the number two, then the sum of two is two, right? But if it was an array and it was two comma two, then it would be four, right? Then we kind of go and follow the rest of the rule. So we multiply by 100, then we divide the result of that, or divide our two by the result of that. Um, but then we're gonna round the result, okay, to two digits. And then we're going to return that when you pass in that. Back. All right. So the only reason I'm really showing this is just to say, you know, they can be quite complex. They can be multiple lines. I've mostly only shown like kind of single line methods, but you can have as many as you want. The thing is, is that it has to end with return. Okay. Well, that doesn't have to be the last thing, but the only way you get out of the method is with a return. Okay. Um, oh. Let me let me show you because I I'd explain that poorly. Um, so you can have a method like how uh, let's say x, and then I can say print x times twenty, and then I can say cal ninety three. Oops, I forgot my colon. Okay, so the only way you get something back is with the return. So if you notice, this won't return anything. So if I actually set this equal to something, I will not get back 1860 in that, right? So let's say, um, oh. 
Okay, so result doesn't have that in there. So if I say, like that, that's not really showing it very well. Um, let's say print, oh, you know what? Let's do it this way. Type. So as you can see, result is of type none because this didn't return anything. So it's like you didn't you didn't get anything back. So as a result, result is is of type none. So it doesn't get anything in there. Um, so it's going to just keep going through that method until you get to the end. The things to note: it will be in the method. You need a colon here, which I forget about ninety five percent of the time. And the indentation matters. Okay, so you're in the method if you're like tabbed in once. And then you're done with the method when you get over here. That makes sense. All right. That might have been our last slide. Yeah. Okay. I didn't get as much as the into the uh, code examples as I was going to, but I think it's fine. Um, most I want to talk about methods, and I think that's about it. Are there questions? All right. Uh, then I think we're done for the day.